Good afternoon, everyone. This is Amy Stevens at the Health Policy Institute of Ohio, and you are at the Access to Care work team for the State Health Improvement Plan. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar today. It looks like we have a really good turnout. Um, 18 people so far logged onto the webinar, so that is fantastic. Thank you for joining us. And um, I need to advance to the next slide. Just click on it. For now, we have everyone on the webinar muted, um, just so that we keep the line clear. But we do want this to be an interactive meeting today and have a lot of good discussion. And so throughout the webinar today, you can type comments and questions into the question box. And you can also raise your hand if you want to talk to the group. Um, so if you raise your hand, um, we'll, we'll be monitoring that. Then we will unmute you, and you will need to have entered your audio pin and then unmute yourself if you've muted yourself in order to be heard. Um, so hopefully all of that will work and we'll be able to have an engaging conversation. Um, but just use the, the question box if, um, if you're having any technical difficulties and we'll try to get it straightened out. All of the slides from the webinar today will be posted on the HPIO Shaw SHIP page. Um, and at the end, we'll show you how to get there if you haven't been to that page yet. But throughout this process, um, throughout all of these SHIP meetings this summer, we encourage you to um, check out that web page frequently um, for all of the meeting materials and updates. So in the room here with me at HPIO today, I have um, Zach Reet, who is going to be sharing some information with you a little bit later on in the call. And then we have Alana Clark-Kirk, Reem Alley, Eregina Clay, and Austin Oslak um, with us here today. And we also have several folks from Ohio Department of Health joining us, as well as others who have signed up to participate in this work group. Because we have such a large group on the call today, I'm not going to go through all of the um, introductions, but you can see in the attendee list who is on the call today. This is the overall organizational chart uh, of the groups involved in development of the State Health Assessment and State Health Improvement Plan. And today we are this group in the bottom right corner here, the Access Work Team. And this is actually the first work team meeting of the summer. Um, so thanks for being part of, part of the first group with us today. This is our agenda. We'll start with some um, general overview to make sure everyone is up to speed with where we are in the state health assessment and state health improvement plan process, which we are facilitating on behalf of the Ohio Department of Health. We will then um, take a look at the results of the prioritization survey that many of you participated in over the past week, talk about some considerations for prioritizing, and then getting into a discussion about prioritizing. We have one objective today, and that is to um, Ha, that by the end of this call today, we will have guidance needed to finalize the list of two to three desired outcomes and indicators for the access to care area in the ship. So we won't necessarily be making any final decisions on this call today, but the conversation that we have will help us um, to further narrow down the list um, and, and, and work on that with ODH. We are doing this narrowing today so that we can get to our SMART objectives for access. So these are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound objectives. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with developing SMART objectives at your organizations. This is an example of what a, a SMART objective looks like. So we'll have a desired outcome, an indicator with a data source, identify priority populations, um, pull the baseline data and then set targets. And this is an example from the 2017-2019 SHIP. 
And today we're gonna to be focused primarily on the desired outcome column and the indicator column. And then later this summer at the meetings in July, we'll be talking about priority populations and targets. So our goal today is to develop these types of SMART objectives for access to care. We'll start with a recap of the advisory committee meeting that we had on June 4th, just last week. And we'd like to start with a poll question so that we can get a sense of who is on the call today and how many of you were able to participate in the meeting that we had um, last week. So did you attend the June 4th advisory committee meeting? So yes, you were there and you participated in the small group discussion that we had on access. Yes, you were there, but not in the access group. Maybe you joined by phone. Maybe you weren't able to um, attend, but reviewed the materials or none of the above. Okay, and Alana will share the results. Okay, so quite a mix. It looks like um, very few of you were part of the access discussion that we had at the meeting last week. So um, that, that will keep things interesting since um, we're, we've kind of been building on the input that we got from that group. Um, and But I, I see that there were also several folks who are new to this process. And um, I encourage you to um, type in any questions that we may have as we go along. Um, try to provide some, some background and context here, but if there is anything, any terms or anything that you're unfamiliar with or not sure how we um, got here, please let me know and we can answer any questions that you have. And, it, and I really um, encourage you to check out the Shaw Ship page on the HPIO website. If you go to the main HPIO website, click on groups, you'll see the Shaw Ship group and all of the materials from the meetings that we've had over the past year are posted there. And so you might wanna spend some time there um, getting some background on those meetings. So what we're gonna be talking about today really builds on a series of advisory committee and steering committee meetings that were started at the end of 2018. So at the meeting last week, the first thing that we did was to celebrate the um, almost completion of the state health assessment. Uh, we started the state health assessment process in October of 2018 with five regional forums. And um, the, the work of the state health assessment is now basically complete and it will be released by um, the Department of Health in um, most likely in early July. And the state health assessment um, is really all about data and it includes these three components. So there was a report on regional forum findings that we released in December. Um, there is a summary report that will be um, released in July and then also the online SHA, which is the interactive website where you can um, download county level data and really dig into and explore all of the data um, on a wide variety of topics. Uh, thank you to everyone who's provided input on the state health assessment, um, including many of you filled out a Shaw review survey um, that we had out a few months ago, um, and, and lots of folks were able to review the draft of the, the Shaw summary report and give us feedback, um, and also on the online Shaw, so we really appreciate that input. The next question, um, the next poll question is, have you read the 2019 Shaw Summary Report? If you participated in the advisory committee and that particularly the meeting last week, you received a near final draft of that document. Um, it is posted in the meeting materials from June 4th. So if you um, did not participate in that meeting or haven't been part of the advisory committee up until now, I encourage you to um, take a look at that draft state health assessment summary. All right, looks like most of you have filled out that poll. 
And all right, 22% have read all 40 pages. Fantastic. Um, some of you have read the two-page executive summary. Many of you have skimmed it. Um, and uh, some of you have not yet read it. So a lot of what we're talking about today really builds upon the findings of the state health assessment. That's really our bedrock in terms of um, being informed by the data on what the greatest challenges um, and strengths are for us as a state. And so um, for those of you in the not yet category, we, we encourage you to check out that draft posted under the June 4th meeting materials. Moving on to the timeline. Um, so this is the timeline specifically for the ship phase of the work. So we are here in June with this first round of work team meetings. And um, all of these meeting dates are posted on the, the HPIO Shaw ship page. And our end goal is to, we need to deliver the final ship document to ODH by the end of September. Um, so that is why we will all be very busy this summer with all of these meetings. And since many of you are somewhat new to this process, I wanna um, just kind of remind all of us of the purpose of the ship, it's really about getting all of us rowing in the same direction to improve population health in Ohio. And that's why it's important for us to be concise and prioritize toward common goals. And I know that prioritizing is difficult work. Um, I'm sure we'll have a challenging conversation um, this afternoon about how to prioritize, but it is necessary if we're gonna get strategic about working together to improve outcomes. The SHIP will be a tool to align state agencies. We have a steering committee for this work that includes uh, leadership from these agencies. And it's also about increasing alignment and um, collaboration at the local level with a wide variety of partners, including the ones that are listed here. The SHIP is our opportunity to track progress over time. And um, this is a look at kind of an initial progress report on the measurable objectives that were in the last SHIP. And you can see that we still have a lot of room for improvement. On this chart, yellow indicates little or no detectable change and red indicates things are getting worse. Green indicates things are improving and we, we don't have any green on here. But that is really the purpose of the SHIP. Um, is to envision um, what it would be like if we could get Ohio into the green. So this is all about improvement. Um, so setting those goals, setting those targets and working together towards improving our outcomes in Ohio. And the goal of the SHIP is also to ensure that all Ohioans have the opportunity to achieve their full health potential. And this means eliminating disparities and inequities and achieving health equity. And so you will see health equity components built in throughout the SHIP process, including um, in terms of disaggregating data and um, looking at priority populations for our measurable objectives that we'll track over time. And then also when we're looking at strategies, really elevating those strategies that are gonna eliminate disparities and inequities and take on racism and discrimination. We are doing this work um, in conjunction with development of the maternal and child health and maternal infant early childhood home visiting or MICV, and that's the last time I'm gonna spell out that acronym. Um, so ODH is also um, leading the MCH MICV work and we are working with them to develop an assessment um, that is being done in conjunction with the Shaw and the SHIP. And so Reem provided an update, Reem Alley um, here from HPIO provided an update on this project at the June 4th meeting. And these are some priorities um, that they are, they're in the process of identif identifying what the priorities will be for the MCH McV plan. And these are the things that are rising to the top so far, but this process is ongoing and will be ongoing through the summer. 
Now we'll take a look at the framework for the ship and the key components. This is the framework that will be guiding our overall work. And um, you'll notice that this looks somewhat different from the framework that we used in the last ship. The purpose of the changes that we made to the framework were really in response to feedback that we got from all of you, and in, in particular from the advisory committee and the steering committee. Um, so the first thing was to flip the ship. So moving um, those community conditions, health behaviors and access to care um, to a more prominent place to, to really put a focus on those and help us to reach out to sectors beyond health. Um, also simplifying um, some of the language and adding these questions across the top that will help to orient folks to the ship who might not be from a public health background. And then to elevate equity to really put that um, front and center in the framework. Here's where we are with access to care, um, that bottom blue box. And throughout our conversation today, please be thinking about how access intersects with the other um, blue box topics and how it contributes to the green outcomes. These are the main components of the ship. So we have our SMART objectives, and that's primarily what we're talking about today. Priority populations, those are groups with the worst health outcomes, and we'll be um, talking about that in the July meetings. Evidence-based strategies, um, those will be addressed towards the end of the summer, including strategies to reduce disparities, inequities, racism, and discrimination. So again, today we're focused on this SMART objective um, piece of the work. As a reminder, this is the objective for our call today. And this will help us to get to SMART objectives for access to care. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause here for a minute since we do have some new, new folks um, as part of this group and just see if there are any, any questions about any of the material that I just covered. I'm seeing any? So use the, the question box um, if you have any questions or if you'd like to speak to the group, you can raise your hand. This is a question to the HPIO team. Who, who can see if hands are raised? Okay, Alana is watching that. I'm not seeing any questions yet. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Looks like Chip Allen has his hand up. So who has the power to unmute? Okay, Chip, can you unmute yourself? Um, and make sure that you've entered your audio pin. Okay, it looks like, um, Chip, it looks like you need to enter your audio pin and to unmute yourself because we're not able to hear you. Okay, we have a question from Amy Cornflow, Gorenflow. Okay, Amy, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi. No, sorry. I didn't mean. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Technical difficulties. I didn't mean <laughs> to hit that. I, but I do know that it said, um, I just heard someone say unmuted just then. Um, but it, when I first entered my pin, it said listen only mode or something. So just, I wasn't sure if you knew that, but okay. that was a completely unintended hand raise. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Well, that was, that was a great, great test case case to, make to make sure that, that the sound is working. working. All right, thank, thank you. you. If anyone else would like to raise their hand. Okay, then I'm gonna move us along. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Okay, we're taking care of that.
The next thing we're going to do is um, talk about prioritizing. And to do that, we're, we're going to start by um, taking a look at the results of the prioritization survey. Um, today is really all about narrowing down. And these are the sources of information that we're drawing upon to um, set the ship priorities and to help us narrow down. So in the top left, we have the stakeholder input, and that came from the regional forums. And then um, the secondary data, um, that's the information that's in the online SHA and, and what's summarized in the SHA summary report. And then we're filtering that through input from all of you, including the small group discussion, discussions that we had on um, June 4th. And then um, that informed the survey that, that we sent out and um, also our conversation today. So all of you are the subject matter experts on access. And um, since you signed up for this group, we assume that you are the people with the passion and knowledge for um, the access to care topic. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the prioritization survey was filled out by um, the, the members of the advisory group and the steering committee in general. Um, so a little bit broader range of expertise. So we want to share these results with you today um, and then kind of continue to build on that to further narrow down. We sent out the survey to um, these three groups of stakeholders and we had 55 respondents. So that is a 33% response rate. Here are the results of um, the question about access outcomes. And we are going to focus today, we're going to use these results to um, narrow things down to focus on the ones that are in the red box here. I also want to provide an update on where priorities are shaping up for the other areas in the SHIP framework. Um, nothing is final yet because these meetings are still ongoing, but um, we do have a pretty good sense from the small group discussions we had on, on June 4th, as well as from the online survey as to, to where things are headed. So um, for mental health and addiction, um, it's looking like this area is gonna stay pretty much the same. We may be pulling in um, something more specific to adolescents here in addition. Um, in chronic disease, um, this is also looking like it will um, likely stay similar to what it was last time around. Um, there has been some discussion of replacing child asthma with child lead poisoning, um, and we'll continue to um, discuss that possibility with the MCH folks. And then oral health was discussed quite a bit at the meeting last week. And um, the preference in the survey results was to include oral health as a strategy um, to address heart disease and other systemic health issues. And then in the maternal and infant health bucket, um, there is strong inf interest in the group to add maternal mortality um, and or maternal morbidity. And those will likely replace low birth weight and it's also possible that this category will be renamed um, depending on which um, desired outcomes end up in the final version. And then focusing on um, the blue boxes here for community conditions, the top um, topics um, voted in the prioritization survey were housing, economic conditions, violence and trauma, and education. And in the health behaviors, category, we have nutrition, or sorry, tobacco was, was the top one, um, nutrition and physical activity, and a lot of interest in focusing those on children and adolescents. And now we're going to discuss some considerations for prioritizing. And for this, I'm going to um, turn it over to my colleague, Zach Reed. Thanks, Amy. 
Um, and as Amy mentioned, today our objective is to provide input um, needed to prioritize two to three desired outcomes related to access to care. And on the handout that you received for the June 4th meeting and in the online survey, those desired outcomes were grouped into the subtopics that you see here. As another reminder, here are the prioritization criteria that we're considering uh, when we're selecting desired outcomes for access to care uh, factors. Uh, the first is ability to track progress. So here we're looking at the availability of measurable indicators to assess and report progress in a meaningful way on the outcomes. Uh, we're also asking, is data collected and reported on an annual basis? Uh, is that data available at a state and local level? Um, and then can that data be disaggregated for different subgroups that might experience inequities or disparities? In potential for impact, we're looking at the availability of evidence-based strategies, whether those evidence-based strategies may have other potential beneficial outcomes that would be of interest to the state. And here's where we're looking at the feasibility of uh, the strategies to address the desired outcome and the feasibility of implementing those strategies at the state or the local level. Under connection to SHIP health outcome priorities, we're looking at the extent to which the health factors contribute to the health outcomes that Amy just talked about, um, those health outcomes that are shaping up as priorities in this edition of the SHIP. Under nature of the problem, we're looking at the uh, magnitude of the problem, its severity, uh, whether there are groups that experience inequities and disparities, how Ohio performs relative to the US and how Ohio is uh, moving over time related to the outcome. Most of this information is provided through the online Shaw and then key findings were summarized in the summary report. Finally, under alignment, uh, we're looking for particularly alignment with local priorities and we got information about those local priorities through the Shaw Regional Forums um, and the Regional Forum Findings Report. Uh, we also got input through the online survey. Here we're also looking at alignment with other state and federal initiatives, including the MCH and McV uh, block grants. We're also looking at alignment with other state agency plans be those transportation plans, education plans, housing, et cetera. We've already provided quite a bit of information on the last three prioritization criteria through meetings and the uh, Shaw process. I'm going to provide some more information on the ability to track progress related to these desired outcomes and the potential for impact. At several points um, throughout this next segment of the presentation, we will be pausing to ask for your input on desired outcomes related to all five of the prioritization criteria on the screen. Um, so please do um, make the preparations that you'll need to talk with us or um, type your questions into the question box. First, we're gonna take a high level look at the data sources uh, that we turn to to find indicators related to access to care. There are several national data sources and those data sources are grouped uh, together above the white line on this table. These national sources are mostly surveys that track access to care related metrics. Uh, most are updated annually. Uh, but for most of these uh, surveys, getting data at the local level and in some cases getting data disaggregated for subgroups isn't possible or it requires um, using pool, pooled years of data, um, analyzing raw data or has other limitations. There are also several um, state level or excuse me, state administered uh, surveys or agencies that collect uh, data that could be used to track uh, progress on these outcomes, and those are grouped below the white line on this slide. 
data is usually available for sub-state areas, usually at the county level um, from these sources, but data from these sources is typically not collected on an annual basis. And there's some concern uh, with some surveys that the sample sizes aren't always sufficient to be generalized to the entire population. So at this point, we want to just um, pause here for a moment and see if there's any questions related to the data sources that we've turned to. All right, it doesn't. Okay. All right, so uh, we did have a question from a participant, and the question is, when we talk generally about the availability of data at the local level, what do you mean by local? Um, do you mean city, county, et cetera? Um, in this slide, I've been a little more general. Um, typically, local level data is available at the county and or the city level. Um, some sources, like for instance, the American Community Survey also make data available at the census tract and other subdivision levels. Um, but as we go through each one of the indicators, we'll provide a little bit more um, information about that. Okay, um, so another question we have is why are the YRBS and the OYTS, those are the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance uh, Survey, excuse me, and the Ohio Youth Tobacco Survey not included as sources? Um, those are sources that we did not um, pull the access to care indicators from that were included on the June 4th handout. Um, or in the online survey. Generally, those sources collect information about health behaviors, but if there are indicators from those surveys that might be useful, that would certainly be the type of feedback we're looking for through this discussion. They'll be on the list for health behaviors and for health outcomes. They will be on the list of data sources for health behaviors and health outcomes as well. Uh, so there's a question about vital statistics data, and yes, that is um, one that we're considering as a Ohio Department of Health as a source. So again, this is a general overview of some of the um, limitations and strengths of the data sources that we looked to um, to pull the indicators that were included on your handout and in the online survey, certainly not a comprehensive list. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and move along. It doesn't look like there's any other questions. When we are thinking about the potential for making an impact on the desired outcomes that we prioritize, in the context of the SHIP, we're primarily talking about the evidence-based strategies that might be included um, to help us move the needle on the outcomes that are prioritized. And here um, on these next three slides, I'll pull some examples from strategies that were highlighted in the 2017 to 2019 SHIP, just to kind of get your heads around this idea of how we're thinking about potential for impact. So if we looked at the desired outcome to increase uh, health insurance coverage, Two strategies from the last ship were maintaining current Medicaid extension or expansion eligibility levels, and then providing health insurance, enrollment, and outreach support to people who are uninsured. Um, both of those are strategies with evidence for improving access to care, particularly health insurance coverage. Oops. Under the outcome, increased local access to healthcare providers, two examples of strategies would be providing financial incentives for students who intend to serve underserved areas and recruiting uh, minority students into health careers. 
under reduced unmet need for mental health, and we took a, a broad brush to, to group these here. Uh, strategies included removing barriers that impede access to cessation services, and then um, more relevant to the mental health, monitoring the implementation of behavioral health parity legislation. Now we'll take each of the desired outcomes in turn. Again, I'm going to share some basic information about pros and cons related to both tracking and the potential for impact related to, to these desired outcomes. And then we'll launch into a broader discussion about um, the prioritization of each outcome. So under increased health insurance coverage, one of the definite benefits of this outcome in terms of tracking is that it is easy to track. Um, it is easy to pull information from the American Community Survey. It is easy to disaggregate that information for different subgroups that experience disparities in coverage rates. And it's also easy to drill that data down to the local level. Another advantage is that uh, uninsured children is a national outcome measure associated with the MCH, uh, the federal MCH block grant program, uh, which means that it's being tracked in the context of that program, which brings us to the potential for impact related to this desired outcome. Uh, because uninsured children is a nom for the MCH program, selecting this outcome might bring additional attention and potentially some funding to support uh, work um, toward the outcome. Another uh, pro in terms of the potential for impact is that this is a strength for the state of Ohio. We have low on insurance rates repair, uh, compared to the U.S. and other states, and so it's a strength that we can maintain. And an example of a specific strategy to do that might be maintaining Medicaid expansion eligibility levels. There are other evidence-based strategies for reducing uninsured rates, again, like uh, enrollment assistance for people who are uninsured. There's also um, what might be perceived as a concern that because Ohio does well uh, compared to the US and compared to other states, there might be a question as to how much further evidence-based strategies can take us. That said, there has been quite a bit of attention to a recent uptake in uninsured rates, so um, certainly a, a balancing act for this group to consider. So now we will go ahead and open up the floor for um, further discussion from the group. Looks like we do have some hands raised. Who's that? Chip, um, I've got you unmuted. Are you able to, do you still have a question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, thanks. Um, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I want to first say um, I really appreciate the health equity measures and the um, the inclusion of disparity measures um, in, into this work. I think that's great, uh, certainly in the right direction. My question is this. Um, as we talk about health, health equity, as we talk about the issues of access to care, um, I think there would be some value for us of actually being able, in terms of our measures and indicators, to take a stab at what does um, equity and access to care look like? So I know that we actually look at what groups have, a group, what groups don't have them, but a lot of the work in health equity at the national level is really beginning to um, identify um, measures of equity and while they may not be necessarily perfect, they could be measures that we can all agree upon. And then in terms of some of the indicators, again, um, looking at where different groups or different priority groups fall 
relative to that health equity goal or measure that we come up with. So I just like to throw that out in terms of consideration because in a lot of this work, we talk about moving the needle. Um, and I think that there is um, the methodology that exists that will allow us now to establish these equity measures, but really do, I think, a good job with available data showing where different groups are um, for, for that. And I think that if we could maybe have that for consideration for many of our measures and throughout uh, the SHIP document, uh, it would push us more towards equity. So that was just my comment. Thank you, Chip, and that, that's certainly in line with uh, the conversations that we've had in the past on this issue. And um, really, as we work toward uh, developing the targets and identifying those populations, um, we want to keep this uh, in the conversation. So if you can please send us, you know, send me a follow-up email um, specifically about those the way to measure um, the progress toward equity. Um, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Oh, and Zach, uh, the other thing is that earlier when I was trying to raise my hand, um, there are some uh, a number of different issues that we've looked at um, in the ship. And just one other consideration um, to this regard is there is a way for us to be able to look at many of these chronic conditions uh, access to care to be able to um, determine where all of these issues seem to converge at their worst levels. And one of my concerns just about when we talk about some of the disparity and equity issues that we tend to look at these issues as they are singular events and they usually, um, they concur, they coexist um, often at their worst levels. And so I like to also, and I know you and I have talked about this, yeah. but maybe share some ways that we can think about looking at where some of these really challenging priorities that we're considering, where they occur simultaneously at their worst levels. Because I think that that would um, allow us to even think about strategies differently. So thank you for the consideration. Thank you. All right, we have some questions in the question box. Okay. Um, the comment, I'll just read the comment and the question here. Um, increased health insurance is good, but may need to consider what the insurance covers. For example, from tobacco, many insurers, even though they are required to through USPSTF to cover cessation, many do not. I imagine there are other USPSTF re requirements that are not being met. Could we pull in Department of Insurance to increase enforcement for Ohio insurers? I um, mean, that certainly might be one of the strategies that rises to the top um, at, related to the desired outcomes that are prioritized. Okay. Oh, and and then um, that commenter followed up uh, clarifying that the requirement is not through USPSTF, but through the Affordable Care Act. So thank you very much for the comment, the question, and um, the clarification. And then it looks like we have uh, Marla Morris. So the question is, does increased health insurance coverage include dental insurance? Um, both of the indicators that we had selected from American Community Survey do not look at uh, dental insurance, but health insurance. It looks like that is all of the questions. We'll just um, move on to the next desired outcome. Of course, if you have other thoughts that come up, um, please do feel free to share those as we move through the conversation.
The next desired outcome we'll look at is increased affordability of care. There are two sources that collect uh, very similar metrics related to affordability of care. Uh, the first, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System is a nationally uh, administered um, a survey with, uh, excuse me, I probably should have said state administered survey um, that is coordinated by the Center for Disease Control at the federal level. Um, they include a metric on the percent of adults that reported not seeing a doctor in the 12th, uh, last 12 months because of cost. The Ohio Medicaid Assessment Survey collects um, a very similar metric, the percent of adults who avoided care due to cost. In terms of potential for impact, there is unfortunately little evidence about what works to, uh, to improve affordability of care in general. Uh, that said, there is evidence that Medicaid and other health insurance um, increases access to care for people, uh, particularly for people with low incomes. There's also evidence that it can reduce medical debt and also make um, financial stress related to medical bills uh, less because it, it makes medical expenses more predictable. Um, so there might be some strategies, particularly around maintaining Medicaid eligibility levels um, to address this issue. So again here, we'll just take a minute to pause to see if there are questions or comments related to increased affordability of care as a desired outcome. And I do apologize for the dead air. Um, we like to provide as much opportunity to participate as possible without asking you all to be coming to Columbus from throughout the state uh, several times over the next month. So thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to our next outcome. That is increased local access to healthcare providers. Uh, healthcare provider metrics are updated uh, very frequently. In the case of health professional shortage areas, that data is updated uh, daily. Uh, that data is also available or can be, um, for lack of a better term, parsed out at the local level. Uh, there are some limitations to really assessing trends, so how uh, the state and local communities are improving or, or getting worse over time related to these metrics, and target setting um, could be an issue uh, for these metrics as well. In terms of potential for impact, there are evidence-based strategies for improving provider access. Uh, examples of these strategies include financial incentives for students. Uh, there's also cult cultural competency training for healthcare professionals, uh, training for medical professionals in rural areas, and then strategies implemented in a school setting like school-based behavioral health uh, centers might be strategies that would come to the top for this desired outcome. This is another issue where Ohio does relatively well or similar to the US and other states. So uh, there might be some question about how much further these evidence-based strategies could take Ohio toward uh, its goal. So here we'll just again take another pause for questions about this outcome. All right, and it looks like we have a comment on the previous outcome, um, and that is, as far as Medicaid goes, we do have issues with churn and individuals gaining and losing coverage and are working to correct that. Um, so in that churn, uh, that Medicaid eligibility term where people 
are going on and off of Medicaid, um, that might be an opportunity to do some measurement around that issue, to quantify it. Um, and then there may also be some evidence-based strategies to address it. All right, now we have a question about this increased local access to healthcare providers outcome. Um, does this outcome address transportation barriers or was that suggested as a consideration? Um, that is, it was on the it, transportation specifically was, excuse me, transportation was listed as a desired outcome related to access to care. So um, reducing those those barriers and it was not uh, it did not rise to the top through the survey so for this desired outcome i think we're talking more about the availability of providers in an area and not so much about um, consumers ability to travel um, another question here is there a place for advancing the idea of not imposing premiums in Medicaid as in Healthy Ohio 2.0? Um, that, that could be a strategy that um, under the previous desired outcome in improving affordability of care. Next question, will we have better provider data than that provided by AMA and the, Amer the health resource file going forward um, through the minimum data set? Oh, excuse me, that was a statement. We will have better provider data than that provided through the AMA um, from the minimum data set being implemented by licensure boards. Uh, we do understand that there is promise in the health professionals data warehouse um, and in that minimum data set. Um, and when and if that source uh, were to go live, uh, we could certainly consider it as an end source for this. Okay, so there's a question about are all these dental mental health provider metrics um, related to professionals who take Medicaid? The indicators that we're showing uh, on this slide do not parse that data out um, to show who is accepting Medicaid and who is not accepting Medicaid. Again, that might be a strategy that would rise to the top under this desired outcome um, if, if that were an issue. It would be great to measure a lot of things that we just don't currently have the ability to do. So we share that frustration with, with all of you. Okay, I don't think we have any other questions or comments related to um, that desired outcome. So the next two desired outcomes we'll take as a group. Um, and these desired outcomes were grouped into the maternal and child health uh, bucket. Uh, after further consideration, the, these outcomes may be better addressed as strategies in the ship rather than as desired outcomes in and of themselves. Uh, the first is increased screening for lead poisoning. In terms of the ability to track progress, we are able to access the number of screenings for the general population. And we can also look at that data for the Medicaid enrolled population. There would be some work that would have to be done to identify which is the best source and how exactly we were to um, build this indicator to make sure we're providing a meaningful report about Ohio's progress toward a goal. Um, there is a lot of political momentum. Now moving on to potential for impact, there is a lot of uh, policymaker interest around lead poisoning right now. Um, there is unfortunately not much evidence about ways to increase um, lead screening. Another issue for to consider um, around this outcome is that it really wouldn't make sense to select this outcome 
unless lead poisoning were to rise to the top as one of the priority health outcomes like um, Amy was talking about several minutes ago. All right, um, so there was a question on the previous outcome, which as a reminder was increasing or increased local access to healthcare providers. Uh, the question is, is there a strategy to establish an FQHC in health professional shortage areas? In, in health professional shortage areas, a part of, and then our health professional, uh, I'm not sure I understand the second half of that question, but federally qualified health centers and establishing federally qualified health centers certainly could be a strategy um, that would help to address this desired outcome of increasing local access to healthcare providers. So thank you. And if you want to provide a little more clarification on that second part of the question, be happy to, to try and address that as well. Okay, so back to the second um, outcome that, that uh, again, might be handled better as a strategy is increased home visiting. Um, in terms of ability to track or ex home visiting uh, is an evidence-based strategy. It is associated uh, with, it has strong evidence of effectiveness related to several health outcomes, including improved birth outcomes, improved maternal health, improved economic security, and improve social and emotional skills. In terms of ability to track, improving data collection around home visiting is an emphasis of this administration. Um, so there could be some developments in this area. And then um, in terms of potential for impact, again, this is a strategy that, that may be, be better addressed that way um, in this ship. So we'll take those last two outcomes, increased screening for lead poisoning and increased home visiting and take a pause for questions and discussions from the group. Not seeing any questions coming through, not seeing any hands coming up, so we will move along. You're all like, get me to the voting. <laughs> All right, so the next outcome we'll look at, or group of outcomes, is increased prenatal care and increased medical home. Uh, so prenatal care is associated with positive health outcomes, including uh, improved birth outcomes and improved maternal health outcomes. In terms of ability to track, uh, data is updated annually, um, and it can be accessed at the local level and, again, disaggregated by several maternal characteristics, including race and ethnicity and education level of the mother. This is also a metric where we can get information to compare Ohio's performance to the US and other states. This is also a metric that is a national outcome measure for the Maternal Child Health Block Grant. In terms of potential for an impact, as a national outcome measure for maternal and child health block grant um, that could bring additional attention and funding to addressing this outcome area. There's also several evidence-based strategies for increasing uh, prenatal, early prenatal care. Those strategies focus on the location of prenatal care, for example, providing mobile prenatal care or providing prenatal care in a home visit setting. Uh, they also focus on the format of prenatal care and here's where we get uh, group prenatal care strategies like centering pregnancy. And then there are also strategies to engage more women in early prenatal care, like financial incentives for participating in preventive activities and then providing um, patient navigators to people who are pregnant. This is also an area that is a focus of the Medicaid quality strategy and several other state and federal payment um, and quality improvement initiatives. So there's strong opportunity for alignment here. The next outcome that we'll look at is increased medical home. 
Uh, data is updated annually for the two metrics that, or indicators that you see on the screen from the National Survey of Children's Health, but that data is not available at the local level. These metrics are tracked as national performance measures for the maternal and child health block grant. Um, so again, there is easy availability of data on an annual basis, although not le uh, local level. Um, and there is that attention and potential for funding through the Maternal Child Health Block Grant. This is another issue area that is already integrated with several ongoing state and federal initiatives to include uh, increase access to medical homes. And we will pause now to see if there are questions or comments on the increased medical homes and increased prenatal care desired outcomes. All right, great. Moving ahead. To our final desired outcome, which is reduced unmet need for mental health care. Most of the metrics that are collected here are from national sources that do not make data easily available at the local level or for subgroups. Um, so that is, that is definitely something to consider as we consider this outcome. In terms of potential for impact, the metric that is uh, on the screen from the National Survey of Children's Health related to child and adolescent mental or behavioral health treatment is a national outcome measure. Uh, so there is that opportunity for attention and funding. There is quite a bit of uh, momentum and policymaker attention around this issue of unmet need for healthcare. And this was an area that was addressed in the last SHIP, um, primarily through monitoring behavioral health redesign and the carve-in of the behavioral health benefit to manage care. Under potential for impact, there are uh, evidence-based strategies that are both programmatic and policy focused. Um, so examples of programmatic strategies include providing mobile mental health services, crisis lines, um, access to school-based awareness and treatment programs, and then policy approaches to addressing re um, unmet mental health need are uh, like pr uh, proposing mental health benefits legislation and better enforcement of mental health parity laws. Uh, we do have a question here. All right. Okay, so we have some input here that the Department of Health might be looking at um, shifting the focus in the Title V grant, the Maternal and Child Health Block Grant, from the medical homes to the transitions to care. And those um, in the National Survey of Children's Health um, metrics around the transition of a young adult to adult provided health care is collected. Um, and the feedback from ODH is they may be shifting to focus on that more than medical homes. So thank you for that important piece of information. All right. Doesn't look like we have any other questions or comments, so we won't torture you with that silence and we will move ahead. Thank you, Zach, for walking us through all of the pros and cons of those different um, indicators so that we can get a better sense of um, the value of including these different desired outcomes in the SHIP. Um, we, in a minute here, are gonna ask you to pick the two desired outcomes that you feel most strongly should be included in the SHIP. But before we do that, um, we do wanna pause again to see if there are any, um, any additional questions or 
um, just comments that, that people might want to make about any of the um, desired outcomes that we have listed here. So I'll pause again for a minute. Um, while, while we're waiting to see if there's anyone, uh, any other feedback, I just want to um, follow up on the, the point that um, Mandy made earlier about um, insurance coverage for tobacco cessation. I think the point about um, thinking about it in terms of monitoring and enforcing existing insurance coverage, kind of thinking about it in the way we think of parity for behavioral health care um, is certainly something that um, is a really promising idea. Um, and so I, I hope we can talk more about that. I am not seeing any additional questions. Uh, no, and it looks like there aren't any hands raised at this point. Okay. So um, as we look at this list of desired outcomes, I want to uh, make it clear that this is not a um, rank ordered list. Um, we just numbered these so that you can refer to the numbers when you um, type into the question box. Um, but we don't we don't mean to imply by this any any sort of order um, with these numbers. So what we want you to do now is use the question box to type in the two outcomes that you feel most strongly should be included in the ship in the access to care section. So um, and refer to the number on this list. So for example, if you um, want to, if you think increased health insurance coverage should be included, just type in a one. <laughs> or if you think reduced unmet need for mental health care should be included, type in an eight. And you can choose two. <laughs> Please don't cheat. <laughs> Please pick two. Okay, we have a comment here. Lead screening rates are measurable best practice models available to increase lead testing. All right, thanks for sending us that. If you could send us some follow-up um, with uh, some links to that info, that would be great. Um, we have a comment here, I'm not seeing a poll this time. You're right, this is not a poll like the other ones because we have too many response options. So we are asking you to use the question box to type into the question box. All right, so lots of folks, lots of folks are sending in their votes. A few comments with some nuance on things to consider here, so that that's great. Okay, hey, while um, it looks like the uh, the votes are still rolling in here, and so um, while while you're sending those in, just want to mention the next meeting of this group is going to be July 15th, and that'll be at 10 a.m. also via webinar. And again, you can find the the details on that will be posted on the HPIO website. Okay, we have a comment here. Several of the choices listed speak to me as being more utilization or health behaviors and not access. Um, and so, yeah, I would agree with you that, um, and I think Zach mentioned this a little bit, particularly as we look at um, screening for lead poisoning, home visiting, um, even medical home, those are really strategies. And so even if we don't prioritize them here as an outcome and access, they could certainly be included in the ship as strategies. So for example, if lead poisoning, um, if elevated, elevated blood lead levels are selected as an outcome in the maternal and child health category, 
then it would make sense to really look at a, a range of strategies and lead poisoning testing, lead poisoning screening would be one of those strategies. All right, well, I think we have a pretty good sense now of the tallies that have come in. Um, and it looks like we're not quite to the point of consensus. So we are gonna take this information and continue to work with the Department of Health to further narrow down this list. Um, and I just wanna ask the HPIO team here, is there anything that we want greater clarity on? Any of the specific categories where it would be helpful to flip back to? Okay. All right. Well, I can tell you that there, there are two categories that um, are rising to the top for folks. Um, and one is insure, increased health insurance coverage, and the other is reduced unmet need for mental health click care. So that's sort of the area where we're seeing the, um, the strongest consensus. Things are gelling somewhat around those two areas. Um, and then there's quite a bit of distribution among the other ones. Um, I think for health insurance coverage, there's there are really only two metrics, um, two indicators in that bucket. Um, when we look at unmet need for mental health care, there are several options in that category. So I'm going to flip back to that one really quickly and just see if there are any um, additional thoughts. So we have unmet need um, for mental health youth with depression who did not receive mental health services, child and adolescent mental health treatment, which is a national outcome measure, and mental health illness hospitalization follow-up. If anyone has any specific thoughts on um, which of these indicators you think would be a stronger addition to the ship, you can let us know. We will also be working with the um, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services folks who are um, certainly part of the steering committee and part of the advisory committee. Um, not sure if we have any OMAS folks on the call today. All right, I'm not seeing any additional comments and we don't see any hands raised. Um, so thank you very much for this feedback. This is really um, helpful to help us um, narrow down a little bit more. And we will follow up with you at some point over the next few weeks to let you know um, where this has landed. And then by the time of our next meeting, which is coming up on July 15th, get to that slide. Um, we will have um, identified for sure what the desired outcomes and indicators are going to be. Um, and at that time, we will have baseline data. So we may be reaching out to some of you on the call um, for help with making sure we have that. And in July, we'll be talking about priority populations. Um, if you have any suggestions for additional folks to join this group, um, people who have um, strong knowledge and familiarity with access issues and in particular um, the, the measurement issues um, or the priority populations, please let us know who those folks are. And in the meantime, be sure to check out the Shaw Ship page on the hpio.net website um, where you can find all the materials from this meeting and from previous meetings and from future meetings. 
So we thank all of you for joining us today. We had um, over 30 people on the call today, which is fantastic. Um, oh, we got another question. Okay, before we end, can you please put up the slide showing the data sources? Absolutely. And we are posting all of these slides on our website. I think they're, are they already posted? They are already posted under the um, Access to Care work team heading, but I will pull up this the sources slide that Zach shared. And again, to emphasize, these are just the sources for the specific access indicators that we were talking about today. Um, there are many, many more sources, um, certainly that we're looking at to pull the indicators for the other topic areas. And so if you're part of any of the other work teams, you'll, you'll see um, where we'll, we'll be talking about those other sources. All right, I think we have gotten all of the questions and we have the information that we need to move forward with the next steps. So thank you so much and have a fabulous rest of your day. Goodbye.